Hi, I'm John Atak, and this is a, the first in a series of Tales from the Underground Bunker, uh, where I'm looking back at pieces that I wrote, which are available on Tony Ortega's wonderful Underground Bunker. Um, we started working together in 2013, Tony and I. Um, I'd approached my friend Johnny Jacobson and said, you know, could I put something on his website? And his he said, well, why don't you approach Tony Ortega? So I did. And it was a very fruitful collaboration. I, I think I ended up writing about 70 articles for the bunker. Um, and we became great friends. Uh, tremendous respect for Tony's work. So somebody wrote in and you know people were asking questions and I was seeking to respond to them. And I think this is one of the most important things to understand if you want to understand Scientology and Ron Hubbard, this is a, a quotation from L. Ron Hubbard. It's a, an essay from December 1952 um, called The Rules of Games, which is extracted from the Philadelphia Doctorate course. And in this, Hubbard says, this is called uh, the caste system of games. The I think the lecture is called The Rules of Games. and he says, the caste system of games, you have the games maker, there are no rules for the games maker. You have the player who knows and obeys the rules. You have the assistant players who obey the players and you have the pieces who obey the rules as dictated by the players. Um, and they don't know the rules. Let's go through that again. You have the game maker, no rules for the game maker. He makes up whatever rules he likes. He doesn't have any rules. Then you have put the player, David Miscavige perhaps, who knows the rules and obeys them. Then you have the assistant players who simply obey the players and the pieces, the um, rank and file Scientologists, who obey the rules as dictated by the players and don't know the rules. He goes on. How to make pieces, deny there is a game, hide the rules from them, give them all penalties and no wins, remove all goals, enforce their playing, inhibiting their enjoying, make them look like, but forbid their being like players. To make a piece continue to be a piece, permit it to associate only with pieces and deny the existence of players. Um, so here's a piece that I wrote. I'll, I'll probably stop along the way and, and make the occasional comment that, that has been known to happen. So uh, some months ago, an astute reader pointed to some of Hubbard's comments about games. I copied the note, but not the reader's name. So I apologize for that because credit is due for pointing out one of the most important Hubbard admissions in the welter of chatter, contradiction and misdirection that constitutes the work of our founder. I had to undoubt the specific lecture which deals with the caste system of games. It is Philadelphia Doctorate Course Lecture 39. A said astute reader had this to say. It contains some priceless insight into how Ron viewed other people, structured his organisations and generally ran Scientology. And he or she was so right in this observation. On a historical note, Hubbard assigned all of his rights in Dianetics, including the book Dianetics, the Modern Science of Mental Health, to Don Purcell, the Kansas oilman who had bailed out the original foundation after Hubbard had spent all the money. Hubbard and Purcell believed that Dianetics would be lost in bankruptcy. Neither had predicted that the rights would be offered by the court and Purcell was there to buy them. For a few hundred dollars. Hubbard had his new business manager, one James Elliott, steal the Kansas Foundation's mailing lists and poured forth a stream of over 30 letters whining about his fortunes and pleading for people to leave Dianetics and join his new venture. He was not very successful. Because Dianetics was gone, Hubbard had to think of something new. That something was Scientology which came into being at the start of 1952. 
The famed Philadelphia doctorate course lectures were delivered at the end of the year. Dianetics had swept the US as a craze with 150,000 sales of the book before the publisher withdrew it as fraudulent. By the time of the PDC, only 38 people could be persuaded to part with their money. Scientology was not drawn from whole cloth, but much of it has a single and sinister source. Hubbard had distanced himself from reincarnation in Science of Survival, 1951 book, suggesting that others had introduced the topic, just as he would pretend that he didn't register the first Church of Scientology, which he did, in Camden, New Jersey in December 1953. Hubbard had been an avid fan of sex magician Alistair Crowley for some time, and he drew heavily on Crowley's ideas for Scientology. I wrote a paper called Possible Origins for Dianetics and Scientology, which lays out many of the places that Hubbard took his ideas from. Crowley was the principal source. <clears throat> Hubbard makes direct reference to his very good friend Crowley in the PDC lectures, although they never met. And when Crowley heard of Hubbard and Jack Parsons' attempts to conjure the diabolic Scarlet Woman in the OTO-8 ritual, he wrote about the idiocy of these louts. And it is louts, not goats, as some authors have reported. The idiocy of these louts. My very good friend, Alistair Crowley. Early on and heavily influenced by a diet of booze, barbiturates and speed, Hubbard simply grabbed at Crowley's ideas and wove them into a new science to replace the lost Dianetics. Unlike other scientists, he did not bother with any experimental trials. There was no research. <clears throat> Ultimately, Purcell returned the rights to Dianetics, stimulating Dianetics 55, the 1955 book. But in the meanwhile, Hubbard needed inspiration and Crowley provided it. Hubbard was never much of a scholar, so most of the ideas can be found in a single volume, Magic in Theory and Practice, which Hubbard ever deceptive calls the Master Therian, says the book is called the Master Therian, in a PDC lecture. This was actually Crowley's magical name, not the title of any book. So the Master Therian would be given as the author of the books. Um, for the curious, the lectures which mention Crowley are numbered 18, 35 and 40. I have documented the plagiarisms long since in Possible Origins of Dianetics and Scientology. Some other time, I will perhaps talk more about the influence of Crowley's Book of Thoth and the importance of the Fool and the Empress in the tarot deck, which is analysed in that book. Or indeed, the use of the crossed out Christian cross on the back of those cards, Crowley's tarot cards, which was adopted by Hubbard for his Scientology, along with the lisped word Satan to describe the human spirit. But I digress. In those early days, before his ducks were in a row, Hubbard often explained principles that he would soon hide. He told us that for anything to persist, it must contain a lie. And Scientology contains some real whoppers. For instance, the idea that it is for our benefit rather than solely for Hubbard's. Scientology really was for Hubbard's benefit. The same openness was true for his early statements about hypnosis, examined ad nauseum in my most important paper, Never Believe a Hypnotist, which is a quotation from Hubbard in Science of Survival, where elsewhere he admits to being a hypnotist. So there's the advice he gave. At the beginning of Scientology, Hubbard let slip some highly significant ideas, which are the true foundation of this pretend science. Oddly, the word Scientology was first coined to mean pretend science. Uh, in about 1910 by a man called Alan Upward. Marty Rathbun has recently, this was written a few years ago, cognited, forgive me, that Hubbard intended to elevate himself to godhood. Um, I did point out to Marty that I'd said that in Let's Sell These People a Piece of Blue Sky in 1990, but he didn't respond to my communication. In this PDC lecture, he explained how he would achieve this end. Um, so, you know, how he's going to become God, the source of everything. Here's a tad more of PDC 39 than our astute reader shared, though he found the most relevant passages a little later. The aberration above time is there must be a game. 
So you have the unmaker of games quite as important as the maker of games. Now we get the rules of the game are as follows. Limitation on self and others, obedience to rules, unconsciousness of rules and reality. We pretend the rules are real. <clears throat> ARC, affinity with others to play. So you have affinity with other players. Pain as a penalty, which will be obeyed. In this game, suffering is just the penalty, exactly as Mary Baker Eddy, founder of Christian Science, had taught. Pain is an illusion. It only hurts because we believe it hurts. Though when Hubbard fell off his motorbike 20 years after dismissing pain, he most certainly screamed and demanded painkillers. He continues, agreements to rules and penalties is necessary to continue a game. Here, Hubbard has put forward his basic notion that life is a game and that we, Satans, Thetans, are playing the game. Similar ideas can be found in mythology. Indeed, that great expositor of mythology, Joseph Campbell, had much the same to say, though he didn't exploit people with the idea. The truth is that like anyone else, Hubbard didn't think it was much of a game when he hit his thumb with a hammer. But high on uppers and downers, and speaking to his devotees, he was above the world. In private, he was devoured by envy and rage, as many of his personal slaves would discover over the remaining 30 years of his life. But in public, he was as cool as a cucumber. The clear has to pretend that he's okay, as the open letter to clears by Hubbard says, or encourager les autres, to encourage the others. And Hubbard kept his violent emotions off the stage where life did indeed become a game. He goes on in PDC 39 to talk about the peculiarity or liability of a maker of games, people attempting to play the game of maker of games. It is a game itself. There is a game called freedom, which is what you're playing right at this minute. Bear in mind that your freedom is only a game and games contain trickery and misdirection to win your 180 degree vector of have and agree. So games like Scientology contain trickery and misdirection to win. Here Hubbard has explained the game of Scientology. He is the maker of the game and it certainly does include trickery and misdirection. For instance, it only takes a moment's thought to realize that believing everything that someone else says and doing everything that they direct is not self-determinism. But in this case, the 180 degree vector of Ron determinism, which is to say it's the opposite of what it says it is. Yet I spent nine years in that condition, Ron determinism, without understanding the painfully obvious reality. Eventually, I decided to not have Scientology and to disagree, and thereby became far more self determined and far less anxious. Back to Hubbard, the prize of winning is making a new game or permitting a new game to be made or making it possible for a new game to be played. Those are all the prizes and that's all the prizes there are. And he does say that's all the prizes there are. Let's not worry about the grammar too much. He then turns to the necessity to the necessity to have a new game coded before one ends the old game, adding, Otherwise, everyone becomes a maker of games with no game. As is often the case, we are led along a tortuous path. Hubbard is evidently reading from a list of notes without really fleshing out his ideas, so we have to concentrate to extract the meaning. But meaning, for once, is there to be extracted. This isn't the usual ramble of anecdotes that makes up so many Hubbard lectures. He has a point to make, and we're almost there. Now, the value of pieces. Ownership of pieces may be also the ownership of players. And the difference between players and pieces and the difficulty of players becoming pieces. So you've got to hide the rules from the pieces. Oh, yes. Now we come to the meat of our astute readers' comments. First, a recap. There is a maker of games, Hubbard, who makes the rules but knows that they are bogus and does not follow them. 
So, for instance, when Hubbard was sick, it was not because he was a potential trouble source, as it was for other Scientologists. When bad things happened to him, it was not because he had committed overt sins, transgressions. When he criticised psychiatrists, it was not because they had missed his withholds, as he would put it, you know, that they'd seen something that he was trying to hide from the world. Nor his broad generalities about them because he was suppressive, which is a characteristic of the suppressive person. So he would make all sorts of generalizations, including the idea that all psychiatrists, psychologists, and psychotherapists are in a conspiracy to destroy all life. And it's like the, you know, the, it said, if you have two rabbis in the room, you have three opinions. The same is true as you go through the psychiatric and psychological and psychotherapeutic professions in my considerable experience in talking with people in those areas. So he made broad generalities that didn't make him a suppressive, it would anybody else. The rules do not apply to the rule maker. Below the game maker are the players who follow the rules. And finally, there are pieces. Elsewhere, he added broken pieces, but let's keep it simple for today. Now, the cast system of games consists of this. The maker of games, he has no rules. Let's pause for a moment and reflect on that thought again. He has no rules. And then he runs by no rules. The player of the games, rules known, but he obeys them. Now, that's the and me. If we were lucky, we followed the rules. We were obedient. And the assistant players merely obey the players. At the bottom of this caste system, we find... And the pieces obey rules as dictated by players, but they don't know the rules. They get their stats up for 2 p.m. on Thursday, as instructed, so that the cash keeps pouring into the maker of games' back pocket. Occasionally on a Sunday, they'll be given a baked potato instead of their daily rice and beans for pouring another 50 grand into the maker of games' back pocket. We're nearly at the end of this cogent explanation of Scientology, so take heart. Now, how to make a peace? First, deny there is a game. Second, hide the rules from them and the bank accounts. Third, give them all penalties and no wins. Apart from the baked potato, that is, and the knowledge that Ron is happy with his birthday stats. Four, remove all goals. All goals. Enforce them. They're playing. This is the Rehabilitation Project Force, the Scientology Labour Camp Gulag. Inhibit their enjoying. And this is pain and sex. He would later write about um, pain and sex being implanted. Um, let's face it, at the end of a Sea Org week, all you have to look forward to is washing your socks. Make them look like, but forbid their being like players. Put them in uniforms with badges and medals, perhaps. He then says, make them look like God. You can't be God. This is the state of OT, operating Thetan, whereby not a single miracle has been demonstrated in 60 years. I think we're up to 70 years now, aren't we? Unless you count changing traffic lights and moving clouds by people incapable of moving a bit of tinfoil, a single millimetre by willpower alone. And he did try that experiment many times at talks and said, if anybody, any OT is exterior and monitoring my progress, then please move the tinfoil it's never happened we end our diatribe i think that's the word with this to make a peace continue to be a peace permit it to associate only with pieces and deny the existence of players it can't be a game uh, don't play with me i mustn't be played with life is serious this isn't a game we're playing for keeps i'll never get out of this we must clear the planet and wipe that smug grin off Mrs. Patty Cake's face, remember? We're in it for the duration. Hubbard again, in other words, the postulates, the wishes, which they've made to convince themselves that these are the rules and the only rules that can be played. He ends the lecture a couple of paragraphs later by saying that this is the backbone of what we are doing. So for any believers watching this, this is incredibly important, according to Hubbard, the backbone of what we're doing in Scientology. 
convincing people to follow the rules without deviation, without discussion, or they'll come to understand the rules and the flimsy nature of those rules. So it was that Hubbard, the maker of games, was the only one allowed to make rules or discover tech. We'd never be capable of discovering any fundamental law, no matter how OTT we became. There were perhaps a few players. Mary Sue Hubbard at times accused her husband of being a charlatan because she couldn't go exterior, leave her body, despite hundreds of hours of trying. Otherwise, the players were simply told the rules. The directors of the Guardian's office and those close to Hubbard knew that the rules were fairly nasty, as the wag who wrote the brilliant deconstruction of Scientology, The Story of a Squirrel Part 2, said. I'm not really quoting because I've misplaced my copy. If anybody out there has a copy of Story of a Squirrel Part 2, please. It's a brilliantly written, somewhat sarcastic um, piece about Scientology, but but shows real insight, somebody who really understood. But anyway, here is the, we're coming close to the, the as close to it as I remember. Story of a Squirrel Part 2. People confuse tech and ethics. Tech is to make money, boxcar loads of it, and ethics is to deal with anyone who finds out about this or me. Now, first time I read that, 1984, I thought it was funny. Now I see that it's wise. Tech is to make money, boxcar loads of it, and ethics is to deal with anyone who finds out about this or me. But then the governing policy of Scientology, according to Hubbard, is make money, make more money, make others produce so as to make even more money. You can see why the IRS thinks it's a religion. And you can see why Hubbard made life in the Sea Org so hard for his pieces. As he said, we build a world from broken pieces. Yes, Ron, but first you have to break them. Thanks so much. Um, we'll be hauling more things from. Uh, the underground bunker as time goes by and uh, this comes with season's greetings and uh, wishing all of our subscribers all of our viewers and especially most especially all of our patrons um, a fantastic 2023 thank you so much goodbye hi john here thanks for watching we'd appreciate it very much if you would click like as well as subscribe and click the bell for notifications. Every dollar helps and we welcome new patrons on Patreon. Or you can make a one-off payment with any currency through PayPal. Thanks so much.